Welcome, player, to the Tolis City by the Spire amazing campaign setting. I've made a lot of other videos that are specifically detailing how GMs can do different things with this amazing setting created by Monty Cook Games. But in this video tutorial series, I want to specifically help players who are trying to get started in a Tolis campaign. First off, this is a great little meme I found a long time ago. If you're playing in Tolis, if you start the campaign by saying, let's leave the city, don't expect to leave the GM's home alive. I love that. It cracks me up each time. So first off, you're a player. You're going into this city that is built on an 800-page monolithic tome. So my rule one I've shared in my, my other videos to DMs is the same that I have for you. Do not make your character from the city of Tolis. Obviously, rules are made to be broken, but this, in this example, the reason I believe this so strongly is because there is simply so much information and so many nuances to this huge city that you will constantly be asking your DM, well, do I know this? Well, do I know that? Well, would I know who to go to? So to just simply circumvent all of that, I would simply say, let your character be aware of Tolis. It's the biggest city anywhere near the region. And have them be a character that's never actually been to this city. So they don't know all the eccentricities. They don't know all the ins and outs. Maybe they don't even know all the laws, depending on what your character is and what you're going to play. So that's my first rule of thumb for Tolis, don't have your player, don't have your character be from the city proper, have them live somewhere outside, and then this is the first time they're entering Tolis. So, first off, what you're going to need is the Player's Handbook, the Player's Guide to Tolis. You can find this for free on my website, ptol.us. This is an unofficial website. I'm not affiliated with Monty Cook. However, he did make this Player's Guide completely free and available for anybody to download. So there's no restriction to get access to this. You can just go to ptol.us, click on Player's Guide to Tolis, and then I have a fully web-friendly version of the Player's guide or you can obviously go and download the player's guide if you want a PDF version to to use for offline viewing so the first place where everybody starts is what race and what class am I going to play? So something kind of cool, Monty Cook Games introduced a few new races and kind of twists on other races with the campaign of Tolis, and that's created and dealt with down here in creating a character, and then it's got common races, minor races, and other races. The first thing about Tolis is it's super cosmopolitan. So if you've been interested in playing a monstrous character, you can absolutely get away with that in the city of Tolis. If you want to play a Minotaur, if you want to play an ogre, if you want to play a tiefling, I mean, just about any race you're going to be able to get away with and walk into Tolis, and depending on how your DM wants to play this, then you're pretty much going to be accepted at face value until you do something wrong. Even a fire giant, if they walked into this city, is not immediately going to be arrested until they start smashing buildings and setting stuff on fire. So that's one really, really cool thing about this urban se campaign setting that you might be thinking, oh, well, I'm going to be shoehorned into just the kind of typical races. Not true at all. Check everything with your DM, or as I like to call him, narrator. But that's one really cool thing. The only race that would be specific prohibited, drow are completely illegal and banned from the city. They are actually allowed to be killed on sight. So clearly, nobody wants to play a drow. However, maybe you see that as a challenge and you want to be a disguised drow. Whatever. I'm just letting you know what's there. If you jump into the common races section, you're going to see this beautiful artwork that Monty Cook has, has created, Monty Cook Games. And you'll notice pretty much everything here you can pick up on pretty quickly, right? Elf, Dwarf, human, halflings, and then this gigantic, awesome lion guy. These are Litorians, and they are a really interesting race. You'll have to read more about them. I don't want to detail everything in here, but this is a race that's specific to Tolis, and you could absolutely play this. They're a very, very interesting and unique race. Now, I mentioned that there are a few twists on the traditional character races that Monty Cook has, has introduced in Tolis. The first one of those is the dwarves, that there are two categories. There's Stone Lost and Grail Warden Dwarves. If we open this up, you can jump in here, and you can see there's Stone Lost and Grail Warden. The first thing is, mechanically, there's just a few little tweaks. If you look at Grail Warden down here, they get a plus two racial bonus on Profession Engineer, 
craft machines, knowledge machines, and craft alchemy. That's because, and I haven't detailed this in a video yet, but Tolis has this whole technology aspect that's very interesting. So again, check with your GM about that because they might or might not be using that technology in the campaign. If they are, this could be an interesting race for you to play if you decide to go down that line. There's even a specific deity dedicated to machines, the god of the machines. The Stone Lost are, you know, the children of dwarves of Dwarven Hearth, which is this really cool dwarven city that's down beneath Tolis. In my campaign, we actually haven't even dealt with Dwarven Hearth yet because there's so much else to do. And they just use the standard rules for dwarves. It's an, a different name, essentially, to, to have these two different categories to specify the differences between the twos. Next is the elves. So if we jump into the elves, there's three main three main groups of elves. There's the elder elves, which are actually believed to be extinct. There's the shoal elves, which are essentially just the normal elf in D&D. If you think of an elf, you're going to use the shoal elves. The only difference between shoal elves and tolis is that they get a plus two racial bonus to being a sailor, and that's just because of the aquatic kind of area and stuff like that. And then also their favorite class is sorcerer or wizard. Again, talk to your narrator because I'm pretty sure if you don't want that to happen, if you want to play a traditional D&D elf, then they're probably going to let you do that. You don't have to use these rules necessarily unless they decide that. Then there's also the Harrow Elves, which are this really interesting, like, twisted race, and that makes it quite... There's, there's not really a whole lot different about them other than the story component. And so if we jump into the minor races, we can look at the Harrow Elves, and they were actually, like originally elves, but then they went through this torturing process by the Dark Lord Ghoul, and he was the, the Skull King. Check that out. Talk to your GM about that, because they're they're relatively... Uh, un, they're, they're not seen very often, right? They're, they're much less common. And they're not evil. It's not They're not drow or anything like that. They just have this, this long history of this torturous existence. There's also the Cherubim Elves, which are winged elves. There's the Aram or Centaurs, Aram, however you want to pronounce that. And again, there's like lizard folks. There's also rules for doing things like playing rat men. And so the rat men are, are a subterranean race that actually live like in the sewers and stuff like that of Tolis. And so you can play just about any of these folks. Whatever you're thinking of race-wise, there's probably a really good chance that there's R already something like that in Tolis because it's just so diverse. And that gives you a lot of options where you don't have to feel like you're you're really restricted or locked in, right? That you can play just about anything, again, up to GM and DM approval. Let me know in the comments what you wind up playing because I'm always really curious to hear what people come up with, especially cool character concepts. Next, thinking about classes. The really only major no-nos here would be something that absolutely wouldn't want to be in a city. But something that's really cool about this is you would think, well, I wouldn't want to play a druid inside of a city, right? That's not necessarily true. There's actually a 20th level druid who lives on this cool little Cathsmas Isle here. And he protects this. He's got a whole bunch of awakened animals that are on that island. And there's a lot of other options in here with the elves. You've got this entire Emerald Hill area, Emerald Hill area, which is a beautiful, beautiful, lush landscape. And then we talked about the Latorians. They have this main area, Lions, Maine, you get it. And so again, there's a lot of greenery here. Come over here into the Nared, which is specific to centaurs. And there's a lot of options here where you could potentially be a druid and still be in, a sur in an urban setting. Same thing with rangers. There's actually a character class, depending on what version of the game that you're playing, what, what RPG that you're using, there's an urban ranger, right? And so most of your common character classes can be tweaked to have more of a focus on being kind of Tolis specific or Tolis okay to, to work inside of this. Basically, you're always going to be in a city kind of setting. And then really the sky is the limit from there. So you don't have to worry about being shoehorned in or locked into a certain class or saying you could never play this class, right? Because Tolis is so cosmopolitan that there's probably a way that this can be worked in. Again, work with your GM with this. You never know. But there are absolutely, I've had my own characters come across 
druids with their animal companions walking through the cities. I actually had a really cool random encounter that turned into one of those, you know, NPCs that the players latch onto. I had one of those encounters with a guy that had an awakened bear and he was a druid. And so this is this is one of those kind of cool things about Tolis that it's not just a normal city. You can really get away with quite a lot. And if you're thinking like, hey, I want to do something aquatic, right? Well, guess what? There's the King's River running right through the middle of the entire city. And then there's the beautiful Bay of Tolis. So again, you could absolutely potentially play an aquatic character. The sewers beneath the city are incredibly diverse. So again, lots of waterways, lots of options there. So I don't want you to be afraid that you have to be locked in, that you have to avoid certain classes. Where there's a will, there's a way, and I bet you can come up with a creative story aspect to make that work in to the awesome, awesome setting that is Tolis. So now, jumping on to the next level, we've got races. We've talked about the classes. The other concept to think about, again, we're, we're staying with the mindset that you're not going to be from Tolis. So this is great because coming through the districts, you wouldn't know what all of them are off the top. You wouldn't know all of the organizations that exist. You wouldn't know all of the religions. You wouldn't know all the important individuals. Maybe you would know a little bit of the history because the history that the book covers and that you can see right here on the player's guide is not specific to just the city of Tolis, but actually to the entire empire and then the world. So if your GM is using Tolis and the world of Promel as it stands, check with them to find out what you're, they're okay with you knowing. Same thing with the organizations. Check with them and say, hey, yeah, you could read this cover to cover, but you want to make sure with your narrator that they don't say, well, hey, I don't want you to know anything about the Balakazar crime family. That's fine, right? That's up to them. There's the Church of Lotho Loth Lothian. And so this is, again, if you're going to play a cleric, you could absolutely choose Lothian as your deity. But there is literally a street of a million gods in Tolis. About any religion is going to be accepted here. So then kind of the last things to think about are how you're going to fit your character in. And then what information do you need to know? Check with your, your narrator to see what all should you read through this player's guide. If they tell you all of it, then I would say it, it's only a, a handful of pages. You know, I mean, I think 20 or 30 pages. It's not that overwhelming. And so I would say if they say, yeah, read the whole thing cover to cover, go ahead and do that. It's, it's not going to take you that long. And it's going to give you a much better understanding of how really interesting and unique this city is. You Feel free to, to use the, the map on the website as well. It's so great great to be able to zoom in and, and move around and get a feeling for the streets and stuff like that. And that gives you, again, a better visualization that you can kind of picture this is where these people live their lives. Another way for you to kind of get into character is think about gigantic cities wherever you live. So if you know of a big city, you know that it's very possible for people to live on one city block and never really venture more than a few blocks outside of their city block where they live. They've got their grocery store two blocks over. Their job is only five or ten blocks over. Thinking about that in terms of even if you've only ever seen movies of New York City, right, then it gives you an idea of how these people live their lives, that they really kind of stay, even as sprawling as this metropolis is, they really stay in kind of their area. Special considerations for you as a player, uh, other than just race and class like what we talked about, is also thinking about the skills and abilities that your character has. You're not going to be just jumping from little town to little town, not talking to anybody. You know, you just come in, dump your loot, and move on. Your character is going to live in this city for years of potential playtime and years and years of potential game time in the game. And so you're going to be interacting with the same NPCs over and over and over again a lot of times. You're going to be walking down a lot of the same streets. You're going to be going to a lot of the same shops. And so this this campaign usually will have a little bit more of a, a feeling when it comes to diplomacy and, and dealing with those more social settings that a lot of people might eschew most of the time because they just don't use it. If you're in a standard hack and slash campaign where you're jumping town to town, you go into a dungeon, you kill a bunch of stuff, you leave, there's not all that plot and story woven together, well then that might be a little bit different than what you're used to here, but again, you're not allowed to use charm spells, that's one thing that's illegal, so you'll have to think about that if you're playing an arcane caster, but you're absolutely allowed to use your diplomacy, use your charm, 
not the spell, and work with these people and role play. So again, if you're a completely illiterate barbarian, that's fine, but you might want to be a talkative and amicable barbarian when it comes to dealing with the local vendors. Otherwise, they might just shun you and then you're never able to do business, never able to sell your wares or buy the stuff that you need. So that's another kind of weird eccentricity of Tolis that if you're used to those games where you just don't ever really have repeat interactions with NPCs, well, then this is going to be very different. But I think you're going to find it's very rewarding. One of the things that we have loved about playing in this campaign for so long, since 2017, is that the NPCs start to really develop a life of their own. And it becomes really exciting when you're interacting with the same person and if you're, your GM or narrator can make these folks come to life, and you can help with this as well, that it really helps you to develop a relationship, that your characters and this NPC start to have a, a relationship, romantic or not, but the concept that they understand these people, that they're a little more in-depth. Whenever it comes to you have to solve a mystery and you know, well, hey, there's this there's a city watch guard captain that I've talked to four or five times because we turned over criminals to him. Let's go ask him first. That gets really exciting for us. It really fleshes out the world and makes it come to life a lot more. So that's my first video. Be looking out for more of those. Please like and subscribe to the channel. I have just posted a video not too long ago that's asking, hey, give me some ideas of what you would like to learn about Tolis, other video ideas that you'd like me to make. Check out ptol.us. And uh, as always, please leave a comment and let me know what you're thinking. I hope everybody has a great gaming time.